I'm going to hit record now. Uh, so welcome everyone to the Science of Crayfish today. Uh, so this is our second installment of our summer season, I guess you want to call it. Um, last week we did Nebraska bats and bats in general, and this week we're going to be talking about crayfish. So um, <clears throat> like I said, I'm very excited about this one, like I always am, but um, this one has some live animals here that we're going to show you later. So I do have a crayfish today that I'm going to show you. I'll hold it up to the screen as best I can so that you can see, um, I guess, one as um, physically as possible. I know you're not in person, but we'll do our best here. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for everybody. All right, hopefully everyone sees the big view. Um, so we're gonna be talking about, like I said, crayfish today. So uh, we have a lot to cover as far as uh, information. And we also have a lot to cover as far as uh, just kind of learning about crayfish in general. All right, I'm still letting some people on. So sorry, I'm jumping back and forth here. All right, so if you've been on the Science of our virtual program before, you know that um, I'm, I absolutely want you to ask questions. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will get to them as soon as I possibly can. Um, we have some breaks in between the different sections, so I'll always look and see what we got. Um, but otherwise, we will have a question answer session at the end as best I can. So please just keep everything relevant to what we're talking about and just be nice to everybody and we will be in good shape. All right, again, something I always wanna point out is that I'm a really passionate person about science. I like animals and nature and natural resources. I am by no means any expert. So um, if you have questions that I cannot answer, I will find someone that can answer them and I will get back to you. So um, I do a lot of research for these programs, but I am again, by no means a crayfish expert or any type of expert, so. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and jump right on in. Um, so crayfish, it was a little hard to find some of this information just because there's not a lot of people that study crayfish. They're kind of a very one in a million types of people. Um, or if they do study crayfish, they're more of the, um, they do other things and kind of crayfish on the side. So um, I think a lot of us think of crayfish. Um, we call them crawdads or crawfish sometimes. We a lot of think <laughs> about eating them. Um, so Crawfishing, we probably know, is like a huge source of seafood that we have here in North America. Um, a lot of people have been doing it for a very long time. So indigenous peoples um, before us have been doing this forever. They've been crawfishing. It's a sustainable resource, um, and there's a lot of them. The meat, um, I have never eaten one myself, but I have heard that they're sweet, um, a little bit sweet depending on how you cook them, um, but they're also obviously filled with a lot of protein. Um, so most of the crawfish um, that come commercially are from Louisiana. I don't think that's probably a surprise for any of us that um, the Cajun term has been kind of synonymous with that uh, group of uh, people in Louisiana that usually um, have the crayfish or find the crayfish to eat. So um, there is something also that was kind of interesting is, although a lot of us think Louisiana is the place to go, uh, the Carolinas, so South Carolina, North Carolina, and also Oregon and Washington have quite the large uh, commercial crayfish industry. Um, but Louisiana is by far the largest. There's about 1,600 um, crawfish farmers in Louisiana. They produce about 130, 150 million pounds of crawfish annually that they sell. Um, and that is about a $172 million industry. So it is a very big deal to a lot of those people that eat them and to find them. Um, but also if you've ever eaten one yourself, most of them uh, probably have been um, sourced from a farm. So there are the wild crawfish or crayfish, whatever you wanna call them, but then there's also the ones that, um, that are commercially farmed. All right, so that's the eating section. So now we're gonna talk about the biology section. So um, collecting in Nebraska, um, there's a lot Oops, sorry. There's not much of a history as far as the collections and the knowledge that we have in Nebraska. Um, it's very short. So the earliest known collection of a crawfish or a crayfish was from the 1890s, and there were only five specimens um, that were found. And there was again 1920s, 1940s, 50s, 60s. Um, there was only two species though, the calico crayfish and then the northern crayfish. So um, the first published account in Nebraska was in 1926. Um, there was a group of people 
a student that only visited 15 or 15 to 20 sites and they only found four species. So if you are a scientist or if you think about it, there's a lot of Nebraska and only visiting 15 to 20 sites is not really a good estimate to what we have here. So they were a little hazy on those details as far as what they found, when they found them, what temperature did they find them in, what type of soil did they find them in. There just weren't a lot of details. There was another small collection done in 1954, but otherwise that is it. So between 1890 and 1970, there's only been a grand total of 35 collections um, that would taken place, and there were only four species that were found in the state. Um, so 35, again, is not very many. And thinking about this and looking at those collection histories, they missed giant portions of the state. So they missed a lot of what could have been here or what still is here. So the details on crayfish in Nebraska are very, um, very small and very limited limited. So um, just thinking about that section then, what are crayfish? You keep hearing me say crawfish, crayfish. There's a lot of different names for them. Um, so I'm going to like kind of break this down scientifically here. So first off, they're animals. They are in the kingdom animalia. Um, so within that animalia, that umbrella term, if you move down one section, they are in arthropoda, which means a joint footed animal. So when you see something in this group, their body is going to have that bilateral symmetry. So they are um, the same on both sides. Um, they have an exoskeleton, which is not what people have or your dogs and cats. This is like the cicada that you see um, buzzing around your, um, your apartment or your house. This is going to be um, a crawfish or a crayfish. So lots of different things have those exoskeletons, which just means your skeleton is on the outside or exo part of your body. They also have a pairs of jointed legs. And then the body section is divided into either two or three main parts. So within arthropoda, then they are the crustacea. So these are a body with three parts. So for sure they have three parts to them. And then within crustacea, they are soft-shelled or malacostraca, um, which means then they are also in decapoda, which means 10-footed. So we could just keep breaking this down and breaking this down, but overall they're in the same group as crabs, lobsters, crayfish, and shrimp. And if you look at them, they all kind of have the same similar physical features when you look at them. Um, so within um, decapoda, those 10-footed animals, you have <clears throat> crayfish. And there's two different big main groups of crayfish, just depending on where you find them in the country. So you have the Astacidae family, which is the native to Europe and North America. And then you have the Kimberidae, which is the largest group in North America, which is what we mostly have here, and then also in Asia. All right, so crayfish worldwide, like I mentioned, they're then super families divided into lots of different other things. Um, the um, Astacidae one is found in Europe, west coast of North America. They have about 393 species. 340 of them are simply the US and Canada. Uh, the Camberidae family um, found in Eastern North America and parts of China, they have about 333 species. And then the Peristacidae found in the South Pacific, which is Australia, New Zealand, Chile, Argentina, Tina, um, South America. One thing that I thought was really neat is that there are no crayfishes in Africa and Antarctica makes sense, but like no crayfishes in Africa. They just don't have the right habitat, I guess, for them. All right, so what does that look like for Nebraska? So within that Camberidae group, there's 12 genera but only three of them are found here in Nebraska. Um, so within those um, three genres, we have about, <clears throat> is the Procambaris, which is 160 species. Nebraska has one native and one non-native. The Cambaris has about 100 species. Nebraska has one. And then the Orconex one has about 85 species. Nebraska has three native and one non-native. So what you probably have gathered from this is Nebraska does not have a lot of crayfish. Um, and also it's hard to find a common name for these things because they have regional names. So if you go down to um, the Cajun area of Louisiana, they might call them crawfish or um, sometimes I've heard people call them mud bugs or stone crabs or crawdads. So there's a lot of different names for them and no one can really settle on a um, regional name or a, a true common name for them. But we believe that the name came from Europe um, and in Germany, and then eventually it came to a French word, and then it kind of morphed into the word crayfish. So most of us in the United States use the word crawfish or crayfish. All right. 
So that's kind of like the history of crayfish a little bit and what we have here and how they're broken down. Um, so now I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about their anatomy and how their body works. All right, so their external anatomy. So what are you looking at when you look at a crayfish? So they have a lot of different body parts. A lot of them are the same as a lot of other animals. They just are shaped differently. So they have a head, they have a thorax, which if you are an insect person, you know that they also have three different body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. So those are something that's similar. Um, they also have a carapace or a cephalothorax, um, which you can see on this um, photo here, the thorax kind of is like your big, like fender, it covers a lot of stuff in there, it covers like the gills um, and also all those internal parts as well. Um, so that center of the thorax, there's these little edge markings, the arolia, and then they're protected and hidden by the thorax and the sides and um, are the gills that we talked about earlier. The rostrum is really important. Um, that's something if you were trying to get something from this slide, I would really look at the rostrum. Um, why is this important? Because this is a huge uh, thing to look at when you're trying to identify species. So uh, when you look at them, color is never a great way to identify them. I always, people always ask like, how do you identify a snake? Do not look at the color alone because there could be morphs. They could um, be found in different areas of the state and look differently. Same with crayfish. Do not go off of just the color. Um, the rostrum is kind of right between um, over the eyes and in different species, it's shaped differently. They also have a compound eye on this movable stock. Um, if you are a SpongeBob SquarePants person, you know Mr. Krabs also had those movable eyes as well. They have long antennas. Um, between their two long antennas, they have antennules, which are shorter antennas. And then overall, they have five pairs of walking legs, or we call them periopods. Um, and they are numbered one through five, and each of them does something different. All right, so here is kind of like the underside of a crayfish. Um, so looking at a crayfish, usually the first thing people notice are the claws, the oven mitt like looking pinchers. Um, so these are the claws, the chelipeds, and they are used to gather food, they're used for defense, and also when they mate. The legs number two and three, they do have tiny little claws. Mostly these help in walking, but also they mash up the food and then stuff it in their mouth. And then legs four and five are true walking legs. So they don't do anything besides balance that animal. Um, also something that helps to identify uh, crayfish is the segments that are underneath them, these abdominal limbs, they have a pair of them called pleopods. Um, so the first one, the first pleopod is used by a male and he will use them to transfer that sperm to a female. And then the female will actually use them, hers, to hold the eggs um, and have them attached to her. So um, they're very different uses in different females versus uh, males. And then the tail, when you look at it, it has that telson, kind of that little middle part right there. And on the side, it has uropods. So the like fan looking mermaid things, those are the uropods. And then when you open the mouth, um, they have the, it is flanked by these things called maxillipeds, which are the things that like chop the food up. And you can see they have a second, they have a third, they have a first, those little things like chop the food up. And when I show you one today, it looks like they never stop moving. So they're always going like this. All right, so just again, um, I found this and I thought it was really interesting. So people have always asked, how do you tell a female from a male? It's very difficult. The thing to look at um, is this uh, little part called the female seminal receptor. Um, but that's not always helpful because this crayfish, and apparently it happens about two to 7% of the time, um, they have both parts, but they are not true hermaphrodites. They just simply have, um, it is a functional male in this picture at least, um, but it has a female part, um, but it's just an immature female part. So it would just be a female that would not yet reach that sexual maturity, um, but the male would have his functional parts. Um, but I guess it's called intersex in crayfish stations and it, it's pretty well studied. Um, a lot of people did not know, I did not know this was a thing, um, but apparently it is not a true hermaphrodite, um, which everyone knows that's kind of the term if you have both parts, um, but this one apparently in crustaceans it is not. All right, so looking at their digestive system, um, it looks simple from the outside, but overall they have three main areas. They have a foregut, 
a mid gut and a hind gut. Uh, so the foregut kind of closer to the uh, head is going to have two parts, the esophagus and the stomach. So digestion begins at the mouth where those maxillipeds, the, the ones that I always said were moving, they shred the food items and then they stuff them into the esophagus and down the stomach. Well, the stomach then has two chambers. The cardiac stomach, which is the larger one, um, it has these things called gastroliths in it, which are stomach stones that kind of help the animal uh, grind up its food and turn it into mush. And then they have the pyloric stomach, which is the smaller one near the end of the body or the second part of the body. And these are the ones with those digestive enzymes in them um, that help kind of really chemically break down that food. All right, they also have this thing called a hepatopancreas. Um, so this is an organ that produces all of those digestive enzymes. And basically it just breaks down everything um, in there so that they can then pass it to the next um, part of their body. So they also have a, what we call a mid gut. We're not really sure why they have that. It's not really understood what its function is. They believe that it's kind of just a space to almost like stop and breathe until it passes then down into the hind gut. Um, and then once it reaches the hind gut and then they, they poop it out the other end. So between those two stomachs though, there is something called a gastric mill. Um, it has actually these things called chitinous teeth, which chitin is something that is made like, um, on the exoskeleton as well. Um, and it just grinds the food farther down into mush. Um, and then just behind the gastric mill is a little filter that stops things from um, going farther down. So if the food hasn't been crushed up enough or if it's something that they cannot digest, it is either spit out or if it needs to be reground up again, it goes back through that cycle. So um, it sounds kind of complicated, but basically they just keep moving things down. And then once it gets to that filter, it either gets spit out or it gets recycled through and then they ground it back up again. All right. So their circulatory system, so they have something called an open system, um, which uh, basically is just the big body cavity where the blood kind of just goes, not everywhere, it's a little bit more organized than that, but the blood just goes farther down into these big cavities. Um, so the heart then is located in a thing called the pericardial sinus, which is kind of the upper part of the thorax, and it pumps the blood into the different arteries. So one of those arteries um, carries the blood forward to the eyes and the brain and the antenna. Another pair carries it to the stomach. And then the last one, that dorsal abdominal one, will feed the blood to the abdominal muscles and the intestines. So basically it has three different sections and that blood is able to get then to all the different um, parts and pieces that it needs to. All right, so that sternal artery, artery will actually drop down, which is right here by the heart. And it drops down to the end to feed to those appendages and to their nerve cord. Um, then once the artery basically bathes the cells and the organs, it collects in this area called the sternal sinus at the bottom of the thorax. And then from there, it goes to the gills. Um, and then also it will end up being recycled through its body. So very common um, for us, our blood is continuously recycling. Same for crayfish as well. They just do it in a little bit different of a way, a little bit more um, primitive or almost, a, I don't want to say simple, but more of a primitive way. All right, you're learning more about crayfish than you ever wanted to know. They also have a nervous system. So <clears throat> it mainly consists of this basically this central nerve cord, um, and it has a lot of different swellings or what we call ganglia. Um, from those ganglia then, it basically branches out into different appendages and different muscle areas. So um, part of it goes to the brain, the, some of the nerve cords will actually go to the eyes, the antenna, and then those antennules. The eyes, like I mentioned, they are compound movable stalks and they have lots of different little facets in them. So they have a compound main eye, which is kind of made up of tiny little eyes inside. But again, you see it's, it's not again simple, but it's very simpler compared to our um, nervous system. All right, and then how do they reproduce? They have testes, they have ovaries that are located in different parts of the thorax, depending if it's a male, depending if it's a female. Um, in the female, the eggs will pass down what's called the oviduct, um, basically by the third pair of walking legs. Um, this is also uh, a pair of ducts that carry the sperm to openings kind of towards the end of the, or the back of the legs. And then uh, males, the vas deferens, also pack the sperm into these little things called spermatophores, which are like little 
little packages, and then they are later transferred to the female. So um, there's a lot of other animals that also use the spermatophores. Um, salamanders are one of them as well. Some species of salamanders will do that. Um, so they pack all their little sperm into a little package, and then the female will pick it up. All right, and then their excretory system. So they have a green gland, which is a very different spot than I thought it would be. It's up by their face. Um, so these openings are just below the base of the antenna. So this green gland will filter out waste um, out of the blood and feeds it to the bladder. Um, and then it exits through a pore at the base of the antenna. So way up by their face. Um, also, their urine is extremely dilute because there's special organs that have um, a lot of excess water. So when they constantly get food in, it floods the system and um, it helps get uh, those tissues clean. So their urine is actually pretty dilute compared to some other animals. All right, so that was like a very fast um, biology of crayfish, um, kind of the internal and external anatomy. And I do think that's important because we're gonna be talking about some things and I wanted to make sure you understand what their antenna are or what their thorax looks like. So um, I wanted to include that. And I see we have a couple questions in the chat, I think. Um, Now that you know what's inside of them, why would you eat them? My students used to dissect these. Another reason I won't eat them. Uh, yes, a lot of people I know do dissect them in uh, schools. It's kind of just an easy animal and it's easy to see all the different um, parts of them. Um, I, I don't know, Midge, I'm not a person that eats crawfish or crayfish, but I heard a lot of people do like them. And there are certain species that are more um, flavorful and more, not more edible, but more flavorful than others as well. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and head to kind of like the biology, their, um, uh, their behavior, um, some kind of cool things about them. And then we're gonna end with the species that we have here in Nebraska. And then I'm gonna show you a um, crayfish up close. All right. So habitats, where can you find a crayfish? So at the very, very least, they need to be wet um, or most likely their gills and their bodies just need to be damp. A lot of them can actually survive for quite a while without water, um, Just they just kind of have to be damp. They don't really need to be submerged all the time. Um, just like other um, different species, they need to eat, but they also have to have places to hide from predators. There's a lot of animals that eat crayfish um, and so they have to be pretty strategic about where they hide and where they take shelter. They also have to think about desiccation. That's something that even though we said they can survive quite a while, they still need water eventually. And then also freezing temperatures too. Um, so most times when we think crayfish, this would be like a good spot, a stream or a creek or a lake, um, but it kind of depends on the species and then it also depends on their behavior. So we have different burrowing types. Um, so crayfish are burrowers, most of them. Um, they're rated as either a primary, a secondary, or a tertiary burrower. We'll talk about those in a second. Um, and luckily here in Nebraska, we have all three types represented in our five native species that we have. So let's go ahead and talk about primary burrow. So if you ever see something like this kind of close to a stream or a creek or a wetland, anything, it might be a crayfish burrow. So primary burrowers, um, most of their adult life is spent in a burrow. Um, for instance, the grassland, or sometimes people call them the prairie crayfish, they spend about 95% of their life in a burrow. Uh, these particular ones are found in grasslands or sometimes roadside ditches. We also have one called a devil crayfish. They spend about 80 to 90% of their life in a burrow. Um, people have found though that the young um, and the adults can occasionally be found in open waters, but overall they are primary burrowers. Um, but the burrows do not have to be uh, near open water. Uh, they make quite extensive burrows. They just have to reach groundwater, which could be meters, sometimes meters down. Um, the water is also very low in oxygen. So they tend to live in the damp air, like kind of below or just above that water, sorry. So if you imagine a huge crayfish burrow, here's the surface or groundwater. They're gonna live in that really damp area, not completely submerged, but in that damp area where there's a little bit more oxygen. All right, and then you have secondary burrowers. So these are the ones that dig primarily to escape either drying water bodies and habitats 
or because they need to hibernate and it's cold outside. Um, one of ours, the calico crayfish, spends most of its time in open waters, but in the fall or sometimes when their water bodies start drying up, they need to dig a burrow. And some of these um, have been found to be absolutely like a couple meters down. And if you think about it, tiny little crayfish, a couple meters is quite an extensive burrow for something that tiny. All right, and then you have tertiary burrows. So these are like burrowing as a last resort. Um, but when they do, they're kind of lazy and it's not an extensive burrow. Um, our northern crayfish often will dig a very shallow burrow either beneath a rock or sometimes underneath a log. And that's only because it's winter or it's during a drought. Um, the ringed crayfish um, is also classified as a tertiary but it's really been observed to be a non-burrower, but they kind of just tuck it in with the tertiary ones. Um, they're also found in dry streams, um, like I mentioned, where they excavate kind of a large shallow cavity underneath a rock or a log. So it's enough of a burrow to survive, but they're lazy and they don't want to do the meters like the primary or secondary burrowers. All right, so their behavior is kind of uh, different. Um, so they have lots of things that mentioned earlier that want to eat crayfish. So what do they do as a defense? Well, they've kind of found that their niche is being nocturnal. And again, they hide themselves a lot during the day. So it's kind of hard to find them during the day. Um, the one thing that they really have to watch out for is when they molt or kind of get rid of that um, top layer of that exoskeleton, they're very vulnerable. They're soft bodied, they're slow, um, they don't eat a lot of food, so they have low energy. So that is a special time when they really need to watch so they do not get predated on. Um, the female crayfish also need when they have eggs or if they have young, they have to find areas where they totally can seclude themselves. And then in areas where there's really short supply of burrows or um, territory, they sometimes will fight or they sometimes will interact with each other. Otherwise, they're pretty solitary animals. But when they do come across another crayfish, they actually have studied this and made it sciency, where there's levels of reactions to another crayfish. So one of them is called like no contest. So if two crayfish come together, nothing happens, they go retreat and they go about their business. Another one is a, what's called a threat posture. So they assume that like claws up, like touchdown position. Um, a third one is that restrained physical contact. So that would mean if two come together, one of them has to touch the other crayfish. And then claw lock, again, at least one of them grabs the other with their big uh, chillipeds or the big claws. And then the other one is strike and rip, which actually means that they go after each other. So it just kind of depends on if it's territory, food, females, what are they trying to compete for? But again, it depends on that level of reaction that they have to each other. All right, so food, um, what do they eat? If you remember earlier in our program, there's not a lot that's known about crayfish, especially in Nebraska. There's a lot of missing pieces. Um, so there's a lot of like theories and good um, science kind of practices and guesstimates on them, but it's really hard sometimes to determine this crayfish solely eats this, this crayfish and this crayfish like to eat this. So a lot of people, they call them opportunists. They pretty much eat what they can find, um, but they do really supply our food level, our food webs at different levels. There's herbivores, there's scavengers, and even crayfish can be predators. Um, most of the time though, they are what we call an omnivore. So they eat plants and other animals but they act more like carnivores. Um, so if you see them eating vegetation, a lot of people were like, okay, they eat vegetation, but actually they're eating that vegetation to get the very tiny invertebrates off that live there. They're also very skilled tadpole predators. Some of them have observed being cannibals. Sometimes the adults will eat more plant material than the older ones. Um, when they do eat plant material, we call them either shredders collectors or grazers. Uh, so shredders is they just shred everything together. Collectors is they kind of collect it obviously together. And then grazers means they're a little bit more picky. Um, but basically they convert leaves, sticks, plants, kind of that organic matter into very, very fine mush. Um, some calico crayfish, which we have in Nebraska, they've been observed being filter feeders. So um, that means that they simply filter out what they want to eat. Um, they think that juveniles may have to be filter feeders, but then adults just kind of do it if they need be. So again, it's very, very, um, there's a lot of missing gaps when we talk about crayfish. 
All right, so molting is a huge thing. This is how they grow. So earlier we mentioned that they have an exoskeleton. So that means that they have that hard outer shell on the outside of their body. Um, this means that they have to periodically shed and replace um, because they're growing and their skin is not. Um, so it kind of depends again on the frequency. Um, juveniles will do this a lot more frequently, um, but if they're in a really uh, bad environment, like there's not enough food or it's been very dry, they might do it less. It just all kind of depends on the environment and the condition of the animal. Um, during the first year of growth though, um, they could molt anywhere from seven to 13 times and they triple in size. Um, so again, they're not very big, but still they triple um, in a year. Most crayfish live about two to three years. And that is like very optimistic for a crayfish. All right, so what do they do when they molt? Well, there's different stages. There's four of them. There's called a pre-molt. So here the exoskeleton will begin to soften um, as the calcium basically is taken out and stored um, as a pair of gastroliths. So those stone, um, little pieces of stone that's in their belly to crush things up. Um, so as the old one is softening, the new one's getting ready to form underneath. And then they actually do molt. So the old exoskeleton will split basically at the junction of the thorax and the abdomen. And at this time, they are very vulnerable. They have a hard time defending themselves. They usually aren't eating. Um, they can't see, they can't smell. They're just very, very bad at this time. They're not good. Um, they're not the, their best selves, I guess. Um, and then also post molt. So this, at this point, they're totally soft exoskeleton. Um, so they have their new one on, but it still needs to harden. Um, so where do they get that extra calcium? A lot of it's their food. So at this time, after they molt, they need to eat a lot of food to build up that hard outer calcium shell. And then the intramolt stage is when the exoskeleton is finally recalcified and up to um, standards. They're, they're hard at that point. All right. And occasionally when they um, molt, they will lose limbs or sometimes they will do this if they're in a fight or let's say a predator tries to eat them. They lose a lot of limbs, especially their chilipeds or their big claws. Um, so, but they do have the ability to regenerate them, that autotomy. Um, so the limbs have a membrane, uh, basically at those like perforated breaking points. Um, there's no muscle, muscle tissue that passes through there. It's only blood vessels and nerves. Um, and they can regrow a lost limb, although when they do, it takes a while and it's never going to match the original that they lost. Um, so a lot of times if you pick up a crayfish and they've lost a chilliped or another leg, it's going to be shorter. Um, sometimes the claws, one of them is going to be thicker and shorter, or it could be longer. They just never look um, symmetrical anymore for some reason. We're not sure why, but that's kind of just a glaring thing saying, okay, this animal for sure has lost a limb at some point in its life. All right, so again, tons of information, but now I wanna go ahead and talk about Nebraska crayfish. What species do we have here? Where do you find them, what they look like? I see we have a couple things in the chat. Someone asked, what eats crayfish in a lake? It could be a lot of different things. Um, uh, some snakes will eat them. There's a lot of different like small mammals like raccoons, coyotes, foxes, um, some birds will eat them. I mean, you name it, something's probably gonna eat it. And then how long is the crayfish's body soft during the molting period? Good question. It all depends on the species. Uh, also, it depends on how their body condition before they start molting, and then also their environmental um, conditions as well. So if it's really rainy and they're wet and they have everything they need, it could be a very fast process um, or it could be very short. We had a couple of cray or, um, crayfish up at the front um, of our Game of Parks area. And I mean, within 30 seconds, I saw one of them completely shed its exoskeleton and get off. Um, but at that point, they're still very soft. Up there, they didn't have anything wanting to eat them and they had a lot of food. So I'm guessing their process was very quick, but if they're in the wild and everything's not going according as to plan, it could take a week, maybe a week and a half, two weeks. It, it just kind of depends on the animal. So good questions though. All right. 
So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about our Nebraska species. So we don't have a ton of them, um, but we do have some cool ones. This one probably by, by far has the coolest name. It's called the devil crayfish. Um, this one has a very wide range across the country. Um, so same with Nebraska from what we know. Um, there were technically two subspecies of the devil crayfish that are recognized. But overall, they are a primary burrower. So these guys spend 90 to 95% of their life in a burrow. Um, something easy to identify them is their carapace is enlarged um, in that gill area um, to increase that low from that low oxygen environment. So um, they don't have a lot of oxygen in their burrow. So their um, carapace is kind of increased so that they can have more gill area to get more oxygen. Um, that's the best way to identify them. And that's really hard to say because if you just pick one up, you can't tell if it's bigger than this one or not. You have nothing to compare it to. Um, but they do have a very short rostrum, which is that little piece right between their eyes. Um, their claws are used for digging. So they're gonna be very large and very wide. Um, again, color is not a good way to identify animals, um, but they do have a lot of variations of their colorings and markings. And from what we've gathered, they like clay, sandy loam, black loam, gravel, shale substances, um, but they do like clear streams. So if you're in an area where there's a clear stream um, and kind of that kind of loamy soil, you might find a devil crayfish. These guys are also what we call ecosystem engineers. Um, this is, if anyone's wondering, you know, why are crayfish important besides eating them? Um, their burrows are extremely important. Um, their burrows for these guys, they're used by dragonflies um, in Nebraska when they um, uh, are nymphs and they're small. These special dragonflies will burrow and use those old burrows to um, become adults. And then a lot of reptiles and amphibians also use them um, for hibernation or for their um, shelters as well. If you're familiar with the Western Massasauga rattlesnake found in kind of the eastern, southeastern part of Nebraska, they, um, one of their huge habitat requirements is crayfish burrows. And the less crayfish burrows there are, the less Massasaugas there are. So um, if you have ever been familiar with the word um, like the super powered or um, keystone species, I would probably almost list uh, the devil crayfish as one of those. They're very important because they provide a lot of other resources for other animals. All right, we also have a calico crayfish. Um, I'm not sure why it's called calico because it does not look like calico patterns. Um, sometimes they're called paper shell or mud crayfish. They're kind of just like a brown color. Um, they have some model coloring in juveniles. Maybe that's where they get their name. Adults are usually just dark brown, but they like slow moving streams, roadside ditches, ponds with mud bottoms. So these are a little bit different than those devil ones. These guys like mud areas. Um, they only burrow when their pond is drying up. Up or when winter is coming. Um, but the burrows that they were in were found to be less than one meter deep. So again, not extensive burrowers. Um, people studies have found that they will scrape algae from the rocks, but they will also eat leaves that are hanging in the water. So again, eat lots of different things. Um, this species is pretty widespread in Nebraska, but with the decline in aquatic vegetation, we have found that calico crayfish are also on the decline. Um, so again, it just kind of depends. All right, this one's pretty. Um, this is a ringed crayfish. Um, it's distinctive in many ways. Color, again, is one of them. But again, color's not a great way to identify animals. Um, these guys have a very dark back. They have the carapace below their carapace um, is a dark band. And they kind of have this rusty tinge on the tail. But that rusty tinge is also found in the rusty crayfish, which is actually invasive. Um, their rostrum has a bump um, on it. And I know it's super hard to see in this photo. This little line right here, um, that separates it from other Nebraska species. So if you lined up all the five species that we have, this one would have a bump on it. The claws are usually a little shorter with other species. And oftentimes, if you look at the tip of their chilipeds, they have these little um, kind of red tips and little darker red ring around them. That's kind of an identifying feature. Um, but they like uh, areas with sand beds or gravel, and they like clear streams. They also like to use grasses and vegetation for cover. And we don't think that they're burrowers. Again, we don't have a ton of information, but we don't think that they are. Um, but they do use small cavities that they bury and kind of excavate between logs and rocks. 
All right, the northern crayfish. Uh, this one was really hard to find information of because people think that maybe the water nymph crayfish and the western plains crayfish and the northern crayfish, people had them as three different species, but then some people say that they're one species. We don't really know. There's not a lot of good hard data on that. Um, basically, what you have to look at is the shape of the pleopods. And if you remember, those pleopods are going to be those abdominal walking legs that are underneath. That is a really helpful thing to identify those. But again, if you don't know what you're looking for and you turn them over, you're not going to know this is different than this one because you have nothing to compare it to. Uh, for this one, the um, adults usually have um, blue-green tinges on the claws. Um, the rostrum's tapered. Their claws are very large and strong. Um, and when they're dead, they actually will turn a bright blue color. So that probably gives you a hint as how this picture is. This animal's not alive anymore, but their claws will turn bright blue. Um, they're non-burrowers, but sometimes they will dig short, simple burrows. Um, they don't really maintain a home. These guys had a large range on them, a home range, about 300 meters, which is nothing for a person, but for a tiny little crayfish, that's a very large area that they have to maintain. Um, these guys will also eat fish eggs and sack fry, um, and they can actually compete in the food chain with adult fish. So they're eating some of the same things that adult fish in Nebraska would also eat. All right, and then we have the prairie crayfish, or sometimes people call them the grassland crayfish. Um, they look just like a brown crayfish. <laughs> they have very few distinct markings on them. Um, sometimes the color is kind of a reddish brown, olive brown, reddish color. Um, the rostrum is super short, and that's kind of one of their identifying features, and it's really blunt between the eyes. You can tell kind of right here in this area between their eyes, it's very short. Um, their claws are relatively short, but very wide. They're primarily burrows, so it's very hard to find them. They only come out at night, um, and we think they are limited to about the southeast corner of the state. They prefer the wet meadows, grasslands, um, the mesic forests, or those moist forests. Not really much is known about their feeding and the reproduction of this animal. So this is probably the rare, that is the rarest crayfish in Nebraska, and it's just, there's not a lot of data on this. So if anyone out there is looking for a job change, or if you're looking to find something to study, we need people to study our crayfish because we know very little about them. All right, and then I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, probably most of the crayfish that you see. Um, so we have a lot of introduced, either accidentally or on purpose. Um, sometimes people will even call them invasive. A lot of these are invasive crayfish. Um, we have the White River crayfish. Um, these are widely grown for food and bait trade. A lot of the invasive species and crayfish that we see have come from bait shops. Um, so people use them, they travel distances, they use them, they lose them, and then they reproduce in those areas. So. Um, this one's kind of cool, and I, I guess I don't want to say that I have a soft heart for this White River crayfish, but um, recently uh, when we go to Petco to get some food for our education animals, they have um, in the goldfish area, if you've ever been into Petco's, they have crayfish that come in the stock of gray, uh, those goldfish, and I texted one of our um, invasive species people and was like, this is cool. Why are they in here? And he's like, oh, that's a, that's a white river crayfish. They're not supposed to be in here. So um, it was actually like a, like a launch, I guess. He mentioned it to some other people and then other pet co's have been finding them and they're not supposed to be here. They're supposed to send them back. But turns out they're invasive species. They haven't been found here in Nebraska for a while. And I'm not sure about them finding in the wild, but now they're finding them in pet stores where they should not be here. And then probably the most common, one of the most common ones that you're finding is called the red swamp crayfish. And that's actually the picture that I have on here. Um, these guys, again, used for food, commercial farming, fishing, um, and also for bait. These guys are a carrier of what's called the crayfish plague fungus. Um, they damage canals, levees by their burrowing structures. Um, a lot of them, even in Portugal, they're considered an invasive species. They have caused seven species of amphibians to become extinct because basically they're eating all the food in these areas that are very, very, um, where these uh, amphibians are almost endemic to or only found there. And then they're reducing their food sources, but then the crayfish are getting 
all the food. So this one has a very bad um, reputation as being uh, not a great species to have. Um, one thing that's really easy to identify for these is if you look at their chillipeds, they have all those little bumps on them. It's a very distinguishing feature for these red swamp crayfish. And then we also have what's called a rusty crayfish. Um, this one's pretty common. Um, they have been found up by Gavin's Point Dam, um, but there has been an article out a couple years ago where there's some type of fungus, and I'm not sure if it's the same um, plague fungus that the rusty or the red swamp carried, but they are causing invasive crayfish to die. So there might be some hope, I'm not sure. Um, but rusties, they displace and impact native crayfish. Um, basically, they force native crayfishes to use different types of shelter, but then their shelters are not high quality, so they get eaten or predated on. And then they also reduce um, aquatic plant densities, which is very important for a lot of fish species, um, insects, invertebrates, lots of different animals use those. So um, they all have their issues as far as those introduced. And there also are others, but these are the ones that um, people are probably going to see um, very often or probably have heard about. All right, and I think that is it. So that was a lot, like I said, a lot of information about crayfish, probably more than you ever wanted to know. Um, but next week, we're gonna be talking about beetles. So this is a really big topic. Beetles are, <laughs> there's a lot of beetles out there. So we're gonna try and hit as much as we can. Um, but next week, same time, three to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, I will send out an evaluation to everyone that registered today and give you some good resources as far as identifying crayfish as well. And um, I will give you the link to register for the beetles one too. If you really like this and enjoyed this, we obviously recorded them and we will be putting them under the uh, Game and Parks Education YouTube channel um, under that playlist, Science Up. We will probably get it up by probably tomorrow by like 10 a.m. noon or so. We also have an education Facebook page. We have an Instagram page. And then we also have our Nebraska Wildlife Education website where you can find a lot of information and activities as well. And then thank you guys for joining me. I really appreciate it. We can do some questions um, right now. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, but I did see we had a couple questions from people. And then I do want to show you my crayfish as well. All right. Um, do I have a crayfish that I like the best? I thought... Mm, I, I like the devil crayfish just because it's a burrower. We don't know a lot about it and it has a cool name. Um, are there any invasive species currently in Nebraska or from neighboring states we should look out for? Yes, absolutely. Um, I kind of mentioned them, the ones, the red swamp crayfish, the um, northern or the whitefish, uh, the ones that I would for, for, especially if you use them for fishing bait, um, those are the ones that are just kind of common in the bait. Um, someone asked, we have just reptiles and amphibians that we take around. Um, what should we do if we find invasive crayfish in our waterways? Good question. Um, I will actually include that information in our um, email that I send out tomorrow. Um, but best thing I would do is contact our um, aquatic invasive species person. Um, he either may know that they're there or this might be a total new thing um, and he can go check it out. Um, if you can get a picture of the animal, that would be awesome. I guess I know that's kind of hard sometimes, but if you can get a picture of the animal and you can send it to him, either you can text him or call him or send him an email, that's very helpful. And he can um, kind of figure out what to do after that. Um, yes, someone put an awesome PDF. That's where I got a lot of my information. Thank you for doing that. I will also send that in the um, email I send out tomorrow as well. Um, is the red swamp crayfish safe for us to eat? I, I don't know. I know a lot of people use it in um, commercial um, crawfish farming. I don't know if I'd go find one in the wild and eat it just because you don't know what's in the water. Um, but if you, I mean, you can buy them and have them shipped to your door. So maybe. <laughs> um, what do they look like when they swim, like a lobster? Good question. I would love to have showed you all this video. Uh, we have a big tank set up in our front over here. And um, one of the things that we have uh, scene is when people walk by or they get scared, they have this very cool siphoning that they do. They push water out of their, their, um, themselves and they kind of look like a squid. They'll like propel themselves backwards really quick. But otherwise when they walk, they do look like a lobster. They're very slow. They usually have their arms out to the side and they use those walking legs. 
And then someone said they swim backwards. Yes, if you have a second and you wanna look at YouTube, I would definitely recommend finding um, those crayfish and how they swim backwards. They kind of propel themselves backwards. So it's very neat to see. All right, so that's all the questions. So I'm gonna show you guys. Um, there's actually an invasive crayfish that we have them up at the front to kind of show people what they look like. Um, so this one is going to be the um, rusty crayfish. Um, I'll try to hold them up here as close as I can. I also don't want to get water on my computer here. Um, so this is a crayfish here. So um, try to focus it. There we go. This is what they look like. This guy has been through some stuff. If you notice, he does not have his chillipeds anymore, his big claws. We don't really know what happened. He is in um, a tank with another crayfish. And again, if they meet, they might have those different kind of reaction levels to each other. Um, but you can see their eyes, their two big stalks um, as far as their eyes and their antenna. And then one thing about these guys is they have this rusty patch on their kind of tail area, their abdomen area. That is a key identifier for these type of crayfish. And again, these are invasive. Um, these are the rusty crayfish. They have kind of that rusty colored um, area right here. So otherwise, um, this is what a crayfish looks like. They feel very hard if you've ever felt a lobster, same type of um, uh, feeling or texture that they have, so. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. It says for some reason my bandwidth is low, but hopefully everyone got a chance to see it. All right, so that is all that I have for you guys. Um, but again, if you have any questions, I can stick around here for a couple minutes. Otherwise, please join us next week for Beatles, 3 to 4 p.m. July 21st. Um, and I will send an email out with all some good resources and um, the link for this video as well. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, have a great rest of your week. Thanks for joining us.